everybody, this is T. Falcon Napier. Welcome to Lesson 6 in the Certified Change Work System Coach Training Program. Joining me as always, Dave Miller. Say hi, Dave. Hello, everybody. Today we are going to pick up where we left off last time around um, and take it to a, an, another little level, and that is with the engagement rings. And so hopefully you can all see the screen that I'm uh, showing now. Um, so let's talk a little bit about what we uh, covered last week just to transition into the uh, new material. So um, the change work can be divided into a great many layers. As you start to use the change work system more and more, you'll see that we tend to talk for the most part about uh, only eight of those layers and quite candidly in practical use of the change grid with our clients, we may very well focus on only three layers. Those three layers Layers would be first the um, five levels of productive tension. Um, so stress, power, stress, power, power, apathy, and apathy. And then last time around, we started talking about uh, the, uh, the, the layer, the change grid that divides it into the four different quadrants. And we talked about how you can overlay a great many maps of humanity uh, that talk about uh, dividing uh, all of humanity into four different types. So we talked about these upgrid, outgrid, downgrid, and ingrid quadrants and the different um, uh, changes that take place as we look at someone's attitudes, beliefs, and behaviors in each one of them. We went a bit further and talked about how some of the attributes that are credited to each of those four different types uh, tend to be on the more negative side. And um, we talked about how those move into danger zones and powerless points and uh, we also said a lot of models will divide it into even more than four different levels. This particular uh, layer div uh, divides it into eight and gives you some pretty useful words. So if we were um, talking to a client and looking at their change grid, we could certainly explore with them what their energizer feelings and behaviors may be for activities that are plotting in this wedge. And you see influencer and leader, advocator, thinker, administrator, follower, and helper. And so this isn't a layer we talk about all that frequently, but nevertheless, we can uh, look at a change grid and based on uh, how we slice it and dice it, we can end up coming up with some very interesting descriptors that help our clients to better understand how they're thinking and feeling and acting about whatever the situation at hand happens to be. We took that to the 16 layers. These are, this is a layer of the change grid that we do use extensively where we're talking about the different energies that people have around uh, a particular activity. And last time around, we uh, kind of demonstrated this by talking about the outgrid quadrant and how the primary energy in the outgrid quadrant is the driver energy. The driver energy again wants to make something happen. And then we said, well, we can add a secondary energy based on which subquadrant they happen to be in. So if they're in the outgrid subquadrant of the outgrid quadrant, <laughs> that makes them a driven driver. So they're a driver, they want to make something happen. The secondary energy tells us how they go about making it happen. In this particular case, that driver, secondary energy, a driven driver, means they make it happen by making it happen. So they push it and stay extremely task focused, etc. Or we could work our way around the other subquadrants and see there's an expressive driver energy that wants to make something happen and they do it by becoming enthusiastic and inspiring and motivating and um, painting and sharing visions, etc. about what's going on. The amiable driver is still a driver. They want to make something happen, but they make it happen by um, focusing on the people that are involved and how something is impacting and involving people. So they're really good at making sure that the right people are in the right place. They understand what their role happens to be. They understand why it's an important kind of thing. So these are our real uh, people-oriented drivers uh, if we were talking about personality types. But again, we don't talk about personality and change works. We talk about an energy someone has around a particular activity. 
So if I'm trying to assemble a team, maybe the Amy Bull driver energy is the ideal energy to have to make that happen. On the other hand, if I'm trying to plan out who should be on a team, maybe the analytical energy would be more useful because that analytical secondary energy means I'm going to be very thoughtful, fact-oriented, look at all the details, gather all the data, weigh it all out. I mean, there's charts and graphs and <laughs> all kinds of things with that analytical secondary energy would uh, pull into play um, when it comes time for me to now not only plan the um, uh, who the team's going to be and then assemble the team which is what that amiable driver energy is all about now it's time to motivate the team and that's what the expressive driver energy does uh, particularly well ultimately the driven driver the energy makes sure that things are clearly focused on track moving forward. So that's just a little bit of a review of what we covered up to this point. Anyone have any questions, comments, thoughts they'd like to share? No, we're all okay. good. All right, so let's move on to the next little layer now. And this is one that we use extensively, particularly if you are working with business leaders or doing executive level coaching and they, your client is in turn uh, trying to influence other people or trying to understand how their team members uh, might be um, responding to a particular task that the uh, client wants them to be doing. So. This is where we start talking about engagement. Now we refer to these little uh, uh, curves that you see uh, on this uh, on this particular layer, the change grid, as engagement rings. And so we're going to talk about each one of these engagement rings. Uh, and again, these are energies someone has around it. Uh, we, we do say, uh, and if you'll think back several lessons ago, we did say that the change grid is descriptive predictive and prescriptive. And so when we have the opportunity to share a change grid with a client and use that as the foundation for our work, we can actually describe for them what's going on and help them to uh, you know, develop greater insights and about their, their current situation. So it describes what's happening. Um, we can also then use it uh, uh, to help them predict what's likely to happen in the future if nothing changes, or we could give them hypothetical situations and let them also um, think about how things might be different if they made certain changes. Um, but we can also say, well, we can use this as a, pres as a prescriptive tool well, as well, because if you're currently at point A and you know you'd like to be at point B because the energy there would be more supportive, well, how are you going to move from there to there? And we have a whole set of what we refer to as change grid maneuvers that can be deployed to help that person move from any place on the change grid to any other place on the change grid, uh, as long as we're using the the right maneuvers, and uh, we'll be talking about that uh, in our next lesson. So with that, let's take a look at the, uh, the, the this layer of the change grid. And uh, I'm going to talk about each of the different labels that you see here. And then we'll talk about some uh, subtleties that happen depending on where they fall in each of these uh, areas. So let's start on the far out grid side of things. On the far out grid side of things, you see this slice of pie here and its label is execution. Now, execution means that someone is actually doing it. So again, we're talking about engagement. Execution is a very high level of engagement that translates into people actually doing what it is that needs to be done. They're in the, the, the throes of doing it. Um, now, we use the word execution generally in its most positive light. So the person is uh, you know, doing whatever it is that needs to be done. They are executing on whatever the task happens to be. But I want you to um, use the full definition of the word execute. Execute also means to kill something. Now, we can even use that in a positive light and say, yeah, they're out there, they're killing it, you know, and it sounds very positive. They're making it happen and checking it off the list and doing it all very successfully. But execute also means that they can kill something in a not so positive light. And so I'll remind you about the outgrid danger zone. So inside of this execution wedge, there is the outgrid danger zone. 
And in the outgrid danger zone, you saw behaviors, or you saw adjectives, uh, describing people's attitudes, beliefs, and behaviors that could be very damaging to themselves and to others. So there are words out there like being very bossy and being belligerent and uh, being very, you know, uh, crude and, and coarse and, bru you know, lots of words that just say this person may be out there trying to accomplish a particular task. But in the process of accomplishing that task, there is all kinds of collateral damage that's being created. There are relationships that are being injured, if not destroyed. There are opportunities that could have been recognized and could have been taken advantage that are being squashed along the way. So in this, the energy of being in the outgrid danger zone and at the outgrid powerless point can in fact end up becoming so destructive, so damaging that the benefit of accomplishing whatever was accomplished is minimized if not negated. So we talk about the bull in the china shop, <laughs> things like that. So uh, there, there are lots and lots of situations, particularly if you guys are dealing with uh, you know strong personalities, uh, people that are very, um, um, I want to say a type if you want to apply any kind of a personality typing system to it and this is the risk that they often um, are taking and often the counseling and the coaching that we um, um, you know provide to that person is they have to become a little bit more sensitive about how what they're doing saying etc is impacting others and uh, everything goes along with it. Dave thoughts about that? So is this like execution in a Game of Thrones context? Yeah, that, there you go. Yeah, 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 yeah. <laughs> yeah, you know, the motive was so good, but oops, you know, something is happening. Uh, anyone else have something they'd like to contribute there? I see the uh, question panel yeah, lighting up. Yeah, Jane, Jane, it's a great reminder to hear execute also meaning to kill. I, yeah. work with a, I work with a few. Building awareness is key. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Do you want to uh, unmute uh, um, Jane if she's in a place where she'd like to? Sure. There? Yeah. Hello. Hey, Jane. How are you? I'm well. How are you? Wonderful. Yo. Yeah. Uh, well, that's all right. We can hear you very clearly. So for the sake of the recording, that'll work well. So why don't you go ahead and share with us some of your experiences dealing with people that are this far out grid? <laughs> well, you know, many times they just feel like they're rewarded for taking the risk. Mm -hmm. And they don't always keep in mind how that energy and tension and what they really want to accomplish, how they get to it, and maybe some of the um, negativity or the wake they leave behind. Mm -hmm. So when you said execution and kill, I was like, whoa, yeah, yeah great yeah. reminder. Yep. Exactly. And, you know, when I think about leaders in particular, if they're in the upgrade danger zone, what they're often killing is people's spirit. Exactly. And I'll share with you an example from a client I'm working with right now um, who is very upgrid. And all of you on the, in this course right now should know what we mean when we say upgrid. They're, they're up in stress or up in power stress. There's a tremendous sense of urgency. Um, all the things that you know about stress uh, are starting to appear. And so their patience is wearing very, very thin. And they asked uh, a couple of their team members to write up something to describe whatever it is that's going on. That doesn't really matter. But they asked these people to write something up. What the people ended up writing up was not exactly what the leader had in mind. And instead of using this as a first step draft or whatever and working to refine it, clarify the message, etc., the leader attacked the, uh, the individuals who had done the writing, criticized them openly and brutally in front of others, and um, then wondered why one of them grabbed their, grabbed their goodies and left the office for the day. So it's like, you know, I understand that the outgrid energy wants to make something happen and they're very task focused, but they don't understand that they can often become their own worst enemy if they don't understand how it is that uh, their attitudes, beliefs, and behaviors are impacting the attitudes, beliefs, and behaviors of others around them. So, yeah, it could be a real, real issue. Um, okay, 
So now execution again is one of these interesting little slices. And if we were looking at a client's change grid and we saw that they had activities that were plotting in this execution kind of wedge, we could certainly engage them in some dialogue and with great confidence say to them, this is something that you're, you're actively doing right now. This is something you are actively taking action on. And, uh, you know, tell me about that or whatever. And they'll say to you, that's absolutely right. So um, this is a, a very, very, very important thing. So Anne has her hand up. Let's see what Anne would like to contribute. Um, hey T, just a question. So it, the collateral damage that you're talking about with the execution phase seems, you know, sensible, but it also seems like maybe it's a different word than damage, but it seems like there's the sort of the collateral effects that would go along with all of these phases. Like if I'm stuck in hyper, hyper, Absolutely. hyper awareness. Sure. Is that right? Yeah, and as we work our way through them, we'll talk about the upside and downside about all the different locations. So again, you know, execute does mean we're getting stuff done, and that can be a really wonderful thing. But because the danger zone is also there, we just need to use that as a as a moment to pause and and uh, perhaps. Um, engage the client to think about what happens if they push too hard, if they push something to the breaking point, if they push people in situations beyond their expectations. And so that's, that's the caution that we're kind of looking at there. Um, not everyone who's in the execution um, uh, wedge is necessarily damaging anything. There's a lot of, pardon me, very positive places. Again, if, I, if you'll all look at the screen for a second, I think you can see my little pointer. Um, if I just drew a vertical line straight down where you see there, this would be right there's coordinates 10, 10, so 9, 11, 10, uh, 8, 12, um, and you know, down also. So this vertical line. On that line or over to the left of it, this is a very healthy area on the change grid where good things are getting done in a good way um, and, but, you know, and it's happening, it's happening. But if I go to the right side of things and now I'm out there at coordinates 11, 11, you know, or, or 10 and 11, um, th this is where we start getting into uh, the, the dark side of things and this is where we have to bring up those cautionary um, aspects of execution. Okay. Um, in fact, we've often said to the clients, if you have to apologize to your team at the celebration meeting, <laughs> then we, there's something there to, to explore. You know, we should be celebration to be about celebration. If the celebration is accompanied by an apology for your behavior, I'm glad you're apologizing, but let's see what we can do to uh, try to minimize that happening ever again. You know, T, um, the other thing, too, to think about, because I've seen this with clients, too, when they're really out grid like that in that execution out grid danger zone mm -hmm. is, uh, you know, their lack of self-care as well. Mm, so they tend yeah. to get burned out. They tend to, you know, be, um, yeah. really just driving themselves uh, to exhaustion. And, and so the behaviors end up being an expression of the exhaustion more than a, li a lack of care for other people. It's a lack of care for self. And right, this right. Is, this is the collateral damage that's happening to you <laughs> instead of to somebody else. <laughs> exactly, exactly. So, yeah. So, again, execution, great spot on the change grid, but there is a caution that uh, we need to be aware of and uh, and uh, educate the uh, the client around as well. So they just don't step in that far out grid. Now, execution, as I said a short while ago, is, uh, is a, a very advanced level of engagement. So engagement precedes execution. Until I uh, am engaged in doing a particular activity, I can't begin to execute it. Now, engagement... Um, <clears throat> involves other behaviors than the active, uh, the active part of doing it. So if I'm actively planning something, um, there is engagement happening. If I am uh, someone who is out there sharing the, uh, the, the, the directions of what we're about to do, rallying the troops, that's also an expression of engagement. If I'm very carefully um, uh, getting all my, my ducks in, in order, that's also part of engagement. I'm actively doing those things that are necessary to prepare for execution. So 
Um, so uh, again, execution is a form of engagement, but there's a lot of other aspects of engagement that would precede execution. I mean, who would want to, well, it happens, execute, but they did no thought beforehand, no mapping beforehand, no rallying of the troops, no, no conveying of the key message. Hopefully that's not what's happening, although certainly we've uh, seen, seen that in our, in our client work. Uh, but, you know, ideally we'd like people to have a nice solid uh, amount of time and energy put into all of those preliminary preparatory engagement activities before execution itself would actually occur. So if they're plotting in this little slice of the change grid, we know that engagement is happening. And after I go through the descriptors, I'm going to come back and talk about the differences between this relative up grid part of engagement, this relative down grid part of engagement, and this middle part of engagement, because there are some subtleties there uh, that are quite, quite useful to, uh, to explore. Uh, thoughts about this? Anyone have any questions, comments about engagement? Actually, this is going back a little bit. Uh, mm -hmm. Jane, Jane had a comment, building on Dave's self-care comment. There, ah, are cult there are cultures which reward outgrid results at the expense of damage to self and others. When mm -hmm. trust is impacted, uh, the rebuild becomes a challenge. Yeah, no, it's absolutely true. Um, Again, many of us who are working with executives are working with large corporate sorts of clients, um, particularly those who have been around for decades upon decades. Uh, we start to deal with the old school way of doing things or organizations that are still led by the old regime. Uh, not necessarily a bad thing, but people do bring their habits with them into the future. And if they are stuck in an old paradigm about how to go about empowering people, managing people, uh, rewarding people, uh, forget coaching, but how about some controlling people? Um, those sorts of things may very well have been normal, perhaps even um, ideal, at a different time in the evolution of a company or in a different time period altogether. Today, a great many of those behaviors would be considered to be inappropriate, and in fact, many of them may be, be, may be illegal today. Um, nevertheless, there are still plenty of old school, old regime that continue to operate um, behave, carry themselves, think about situations in those um, older ways of, of looking at things. It doesn't resonate with, to, with uh, today's workforce. And so a lot of friction comes into there. And so damage is done and then the damage needs to be repaired. But one of the old school attitudes I've encountered is that the, the people that are in charge believe that there's no reason for them to apologize. There's no reason for them to do anything deliberate to try to heal relationships because they pay these people salaries and they don't like it. They can gather their goodies and go. So it's this very... Um, old, outdated, um, pr primitive way of really looking at the way to get excellence out of people and, and out of your, uh, your organization's future. So I th does that resonate, Jane, with what you were uh, alluding to there? Yeah. Oh, she's probably muted. <laughs> okay. All right. So uh, Dave, any comment there or shall I continue? Oops, sorry, can you hear me now? Yes, I can hear you, yeah. Uh, Jane, Jane had said, she had texted, yes, indeed, uh, unacceptable behavior. So. <laughs> yeah, yeah, it's true, but it's out there. It's still out there. Um, so, And by the way, um, many of the coaches that we've trained over all these years, um, forget executives and corporations, a lot of them are dealing with the mom and pop kinds of businesses that are now transitioning to the next generation. And uh, you encounter this exact kind of outgrid danger zone behavior, hyper execution, um, and you see how it impacts family members. That's a whole different dynamic when you add that family element into the, uh, into the scenario. But it happens, happens, it's, it's still out there happening rampantly. Okay, anyway, so execution is preceded by engagement. Now, engagement is preceded by intention. 
So intention now is the person saying like, yeah, we're going to do this. Yep, we'll, we're going to take care of this. Yep, this is something that's on the, the plan. Yep, someday I will. Yep, next quarter we will. You know, they're not really engaged in it yet. No one's actively doing the things that are involved in preparing for it. And certainly they're not executing, but at least they've made a choice. Uh, on the surface, they are uh, implying, if not committing, that they will do X someday. They're not doing it yet. Yet, but the intention is there. So the intention could be an intention that one has for oneself, an intention that we have for others, an intention that we have for the organization. And when we start to talk about people coming up with visions, if you think about it, a vision is, uh, starts as an intention because that vision is hopefully going to lead to the mobilization of people and resources to, uh, to start making progress. Now we're getting engaged and ultimately to accomplish the goal. That's what execution is. So, so vision. Now, some have said, well, when vision becomes mission, you move from intention to engagement. Um, I don't necessarily believe that all mission statements are, um, are proven out in people's current behaviors. So I think a lot of times what our clients have positioned as being a mission statement is actually still a vision because it's not, it has, there's no engagement yet. There's certainly no execution yet. So, um, you know, trying to use vision and mission or purpose, you know. So these words are all going to plop someplace around intention and maybe some of them are going to be a little bit more towards engagement. But um, um, unless someone can tell me they are executing on their vision, executing on their mission, executing on their purpose, accomplishing things, I would suggest that they are more to the interior of the change grid as far as these engagement rings are concerned. Uh, thoughts, comments about intention? And again, we'll come back through here momentarily and I'll talk about what happens up grid and mid grid and down grid uh, for that. So any thoughts, comments about intention preceding engagement? None at this time. Okay. Um, now, in the world of providing coaching services, we we work with people on all these different uh, areas. So uh, certainly, uh, most of our clients begin dialogue with us at the intention level. So um, th because they come to us, they have a goal in mind, or they have an issue, they have an opportunity. So and they'd like to do something around it. That phrase itself, they'd like to do something. That sounds to me as a very clear intention. They may not know how to do it. So I would very, I would be very surprised if they were actively doing it. Or maybe they had the intention. They tried something, so they dabbled in engagement. But what they tried wasn't really successful. They're their intention has not changed, but their form of engagement or their approach to engagement, their steps toward engagement and inside of engagement need to be uh, worked through. So uh, nevertheless, the intention is there. Now, um, intention is preceded by awareness. So until I am, an, I am aware of something, how can I begin to formulate a, a conscious, deliberate intention around it? So I became aware of something. I became aware of an opportunity. I became aware of a challenge. I became aware of whatever. And now that I had this awareness, I was able to kind of go, well, am I just going to stay at awareness? So I acknowledge it. X exists. I'm aware that X exists um, or might exist, might be coming my way. Am I going to stop there? Or am I going to say, now that I have this awareness, what will I do around it? What is my intention when I have this awareness? Is it simply stay in the aware state and not bother with anything else? But, you know, observe it in a detached kind of way, see what happens next. Or am I going to actually get involved? Am I actually going to, uh, to, to, to try to make something happen? So, the awareness leads to an intention. The intention leads to engagement. The engagement leads to execution. If I'm really working on this full path, uh, as you see it. So um, questions about uh, what I mean by awareness or what we're saying? I think we've got some questions or comments popping in. 
Yeah, Jane uh, made a comment. Awareness is a choice. Either you stay under the radar and avoid or you step into momentum. Interesting. Yeah, and I would suggest that there are that um, the moment I become, I even have to use the word aware, um, it's almost like being under the radar is a conscious choice. So does my awareness trigger me to do something or to do nothing? And some may say that even the act of doing nothing is doing something. So, so even then, that awareness starts to tip its toe into intention, but it may go no further out grid. Now, yes, go ahead, Dave. No, I just had a question. Is being reflective, is that in this area of the grid? Well, right. The, the reflective part, well, and we, I'll, I'll throw it to you. When you say being reflective, what is the person actually doing? Uh, I think, you know, being aware of the situation and maybe mm -hmm. thinking through how it affects them, maybe how it affects others. Mm -hmm. Maybe it starts mm -hmm. getting into action or what what it might could. we do with it so. right it could but i could also just say i am aware i'm mm -hmm. aware of x is happening i'm aware of how it impacts other people i am aware of what possibilities there may be but i myself am not making any kind of uh, emotional connection to it or any sort of, there there is no no drive as we move further outward what's actually happening is drive is increasing so mm -hmm. i don't feel driven remember the outward quadrant is driver energy i'm in awareness but i don't have any driver energy around doing anything with that awareness um so, so you are you kind of just being with it? Is that just being with it? Well, in fact, the exact center of the change grid, the PowerPoint right here, coordinate six six, is sitting in awareness. And some of the hallmarks of being in the center of the change grid is this awareness of what's going on. So um, you are in the world, but not of it. You let the winds of heaven dance around you. So you're observing it, fully aware of what's going on, but you are not necessarily. Well, in fact, I'll say while you're in the awareness mode, you are not participating with it in any outward, physical, emotional, or intellectual way. Uh, so the awareness is an internal state um, that uh, may be focused upon external um, activities, events, but I'm still just staying detached. I'm right there, coordinate 6-6. Six, six. But there's a place of choice, and that's what I think is so powerful about awareness. When we become aware of something, we are put into a position where we can make a choice. The choice is to do something, in which case now you're hearing the language of intention coming forward. Um, the awareness may lead me to say, I'm simply going to observe it. And even that sounds like a bit of an intention, but it's not an intention to you know, change anything. It's, a, it's just an intention to go like, oh, I'll keep an eye on it, but I'm not going to really do anything yet. So, and we'll talk about what is upgrade awareness versus downgrade awareness uh, as we work our way through the next pass through this. So, other thoughts? I see we got some comments coming in. Yes. Um, Feel free to unmute if someone wants to open. Yeah, the... let me just unmute Jane. Yeah. <laughs> Hi, Jane. <laughs> Hi. You know, me and my acronyms, I always say aware is allows wonder and reflective energy. I and like that. Yeah, it just, you know, awareness is a state of being. It's not necessarily getting into the doing. And right. you're a choice. And yep. some people choose to just avoid or stay with status quo or write it out. And others just incorporate it and integrate yep. with who they are and what they intend to do. And then all of a sudden, I keep saying momentum, but there's movement. And then there's action without making it purely doing so you're not getting into that executive energy just mm -hmm. gotcha. you're formulating right right and even those the, some of those words we're talking a little bit more about formulating the intention mm -hmm. so it's, I, let's just say you know people don't we, we People don't live in one spot on the change grid. Nobody is stuck anywhere on the change grid. These are stopping points along life. 
and uh, and certain stopping points serve us very well for certain activities, and certain stopping points serve us very well for a certain period of time. Um, and so every spot on the change grid has got a certain value to us. Yes, even the outgrid and upgrid and ingrid and downgrid danger zones have certain value to us. It's all about are we there consciously, deliberately, by choice, or did we just end up there somehow? And is our, our uh, experience while we are there truly supporting whatever our desired outcome happens to be? So a question, T. Yeah. When you say that, do you revisit certain places and spaces depending oh. on what you're involved in? It's just constantly evolving? Absolutely. Okay. Absolutely. Good, good. I want to make sure and, I was clear. Yeah. In fact, I'll give you an idea about the exact mm -hmm. center of the change grid um, and to a slightly out grid step okay. is where I believe some of the greatest coaching actually occurs. So now this is inside of the behavior of the coach. Okay. Same so more. the behavior of the coach, we talk about the center of the change grid is a place where we practice the art of caring detachment. Okay. So we're working with our client, but we are there to allow the client to have the client's own experience for the client to be the one who actually is, uh, you know, m doing the movements, making the choices, moving around. We are mm -hmm. observing it and from a very caring place, but mm -hmm. part of the act of caring is to detach. Now, when our client starts to talk about what they want to do, they start to share their intention. We then move out there to intention with them and help them to develop that intention, explore that intention, um, you know, make that next level of choice or focus. And then we move with them as they start to take that intention and translate it into the specific preparations and behaviors necessary for them to reach that. And we're going to support them as best we can, guide them, etc. But as they start to work through that intention and engagement, they may change their mind. They may change course or another opportunity may, may present itself that compels mm -hmm. them even more, in which case we would move back to that awareness step. Because just because for a period of time they had a strong intention and they were very much engaged, it's not my intention, it's not my engagement, it's not my vision, my purpose. Right. You understand it's theirs. Mm -hmm. And so we do move back and forth uh, as, and by, as, as the client does, we do. So we're with them. Um, and, you know, and again, there will certainly be plenty of times during uh, coaching conversations that we may ask certain questions, we may suggest certain angles for something to be to be looked at, trying to help them to expand their awareness, help them to clarify their intention if they choose to have one, help them to um, uh, what do I say? translate that intention into whatever must be done in the world of engagement in order to ultimately reach there. But, the, you know, we all know this, that it's their journey. And uh, we're just there uh, to, you know, be a guide to whatever degree we can be. So does that resonate with everybody? Yes. Yep, yep, yep. So, yeah, okay. So, uh, yeah, uh, there's more comments coming in there, Dave. I just saw, so who, who is, uh, who shared? Uh, Jane says, indeed. Okay, good. I like that. All right. So, all right. So, let's, let's back it up a little bit to this next little uh, ring. Now, these are also just parts of awareness, but um, I, I think they're interesting little stopping points. So, there's awareness, and then there's hyper-awareness. Now, hyper-awareness is when something almost always external to you as, a, as the individual imposes itself on your reality. There are certain physical things that can happen to you internally that move you up to hyper-awareness. So, uh, you know, for example, if for, for no understandable reason your heart suddenly starts racing, I promise you, you will become hyper-aware of that you, you know you don't understand whatever so there's an awareness but there's a hyper awareness uh, where something truly is imposing itself on your reality grabbing hold of all of your attention at that moment 
at the other extreme, very far down grid, is hypo, oh, what did I just do? Is hypo awareness. So hypo awareness is when things may be registering with you at a subconscious or unconscious level even, but it is not something that you are even uh, well, consciously um, aware of. I don't know any other way to explain it. So it, it's under, we talk about under the radar, but I think flying under the radar is a deliberate choice that someone's making. It's a strategy. It's more like a lot of life happens at this um, subconscious or even unconscious kind of level. That's hypo awareness. Um, it's just not really registering with you at all um, on in an outward um, you know, I wish we had more words to describe at a conscious level but it is registering in your body in your mind in your spirit in your psyche um, but not in an overt way if that makes sense so hypo awareness now, before we get to that little band, over to the left, you see pre-aware, and then very far in grid, you see a blank space. We don't know what words to really describe what's going on there. These are things that really aren't um, even making, uh, calling for an awareness to happen. So this is where, where, where we exist, and things exist, but there's a great many things, in fact, I would say the vast majority of things um, that are out there in general and even out there in our own lives are things that we're not even aware of. Not necessarily, uh, you know, happening and they're, they're under our radar because, again, there's something is registering um, there. There's just all the stuff that's just going on out there on, on planet Earth um, that, you know, we've got no... No, no idea it's even happening so that's what's going on on the far left side of the change grid obviously uh, clients don't come to us with this blank or this pre-aware kind of thing uh, we may very well encounter a client who is hyper aware of something uh, and is aware of something um, we may in the work that we're doing help some of these things that are currently in hypo awareness come to the surface more um, and so move more into awareness so that the person can explore it or whatever so generally the work that we're doing with the client uh, is going to be in this awareness intention engagement execution uh, but what may begin the relationship is hyper awareness and what we may help to awaken is the stuff that's down in hypo awareness. Um, okay, thoughts about that? I saw a comment apply, uh, occur. Um, I have a question. Yeah. So when we look at um, something in grid, um, and we've often talked about the example, you're on vacation and someone's playing a card game you've never played before, mm -hmm. and you might have feel you have ability of a three and maybe the challenge is a three like how hard could it be yeah yep, yep, yep. so that would that would fall in that pre-aware engagement but yeah, you're... because yeah because it really hadn't happened in your life up until that point in time it's just, uh, okay you know because i go okay so now i'm becoming aware of something so i'm starting to move uh into these awareness bands and although I didn't, re uh, I didn't replicate the word, you see where we have hyper-awareness and we have hypo-awareness. Right in between those, I could have repeated the word awareness. Um, but it's, uh, you know, just didn't want to crowd the diagram. Both of these bands, hyper-aware, aware, aware uh, hypo-aware, those are all parts of awareness. But before that is pre-aware. So, yeah, oh, I did it again. So, yeah, you, you're at somebody's e social event. You don't know what they're, then someone suggests, oh, let's play a little game. And in that moment, you're going like, well, I don't know what the game is, so, so I don't know if I played it. Or they go like, let's play whatever you go. I've never heard of that, but okay. okay. So we're in that pre-aware, just becoming aware, just waking up uh, kind of a stage. And now we're going to start looking at what our ability is, what the challenge actually is. We're going to start moving in our perceptions to other places along the change grid. So is it possible to take action in the pre-aware 
place or do we move algorithm? Well, I think it's possible to take action. There are actions associated with every spot on the change grid. Mm -hmm. The question is, are we taking deliberate, intentional action, calculated action, or are we just going through the motions? Are we just living and in, in existing? You know, um, how often during the day are we consumed with activities that have become automatic? Um, mm -hmm. You know, so is there action going on? Yeah. Is the action intentional, deliberate, calculated? Yeah, probably not that far in grid. Right. So, yeah. Okay. Got it. But, but, but I think it's more about talking about things as they unfold in the continuum. As I move further and further out grid, I do become increasingly deliberate, calculated, um, focused. That's all happening, even in the words themselves, awareness, intention, engagement, execution. There is a clear progression of deliberate, uh, calculated, conscious choices and behaviors on, on rolling there. Uh, I see Anne had a comment. Uh, there's one from Jane. Oh, yeah. mm -hmm. uh, she says, it's helpful to know awareness carries over. Are they reactive emotions versus strategic action? Mm -hmm. Well, reactive emotions would actually be further upgrade because that's where reactive stuff happens. Um, mm -hmm. Oh, I see. It's Anne has her hand up. Um, ah. And so, um, again, I could probably make some comments around hypo awareness, but again, this is the stuff. And again, if I laid the five levels of tension on top of this, uh, hypo awareness is apathy, a little bit of power apathy, but most of hypo awareness is in apathy. So that doesn't mean the person's apathetic. It just means that whatever the activity is doesn't seem to be triggering any need for someone to be paying any deliberate attention to it. Oh, God, what's, what's Ann sharing or do we? Or uh, I'm not seeing that. Let me see if I can unmute. Yeah, her. mute in. Oh, can you Hi hear there. me? Yep, there you I, are. Yeah, I guess I was just wondering about the danger zone since hypo and hyper awareness are both, you know, yep. in those danger zones. I was wondering if you'd say something about that. Well, sure. Like if I look at the upgrade danger zone, so this is stress taken to its extreme, that hyper awareness is something that is saying, I exist. You know I exist. You are to think about nothing other than this in this particular moment. So I promise you, if in the middle of the night your house catches on fire, hyper-awareness is going to occur. And in the upgrade danger zone of, of, uh, of the, the change grid, which is where that, those S's of hyper-awareness <laughs> of our, our, our sitting, you might become very reactive, start doing strange things. In fact, someone brought some, a very interesting thing up to us. Um, our front door of our house locks from the inside with a key. And so at night we lock it and we take the key out and we set the key over on the table on the side. Uh, it's because the door is glass and the thought is that if someone breaks the glass, they could get in and, you know, open the latch. So it locks with a key. Well, when we had someone who's connected with the fire department come in and do, just do a little safety evaluation, the house, they said, that's a profoundly dangerous situation. Because in the midst of a fire, the chances of you forgetting where is this key, stumbling to find the key, get the key to fit into the, the thing, all of these thoughts and actions are compromised because of the, uh, that life or death kind of situation that is threatening you at that particular point in time. So hyper-awareness can move you all the way up into the, um, um, the upgrade danger zone and all those things we saw up there in the upgrade danger zone about being profoundly impulsive, terrified, etc. all that could definitely happen. By the way, their answer was leave the key in the lock. <laughs> and so, you know, just make sure you leave it there. Um, and that's, you know, just one of the risks that you have. They said from a safety perspective, you would hear the glass break. The glass is three quarters of an inch thick. <laughs> so, uh, you know, so at any rate, uh, uh, yeah. And then uh, hypo awareness, again, we look well, at the- by the way, see, I, I must say, you have the coolest front door I've ever seen. Well, thank you. Yeah, we love it. It's, um, what, bronze or something like it's, that? Yeah, it's cast bronze, and uh, it's, uh, it's, it's, a, it's, it's, a, you know, it's a very nice door. We designed every curve of it or whatever, which, by the way, was the other point. The front, in front of the glass is this metalwork. No human being can, can get their body through that metalwork, but they could reach their hand through the broken glass, but 
how would they even break the glass? So yeah, thank you. Um, but it is an interesting thing because a lot of people have got, you know, normal plate glass doors or doors with a very large panel of glass and they don't really think about the fact that that glass could easily be broken and the door could be unlocked from the inside. So they lock it with a key and then they put the key in a drawer in a table close by. But in the point of, uh, you know, a fire when you've got to get out of that house, um, that upgrade danger zone can very much negatively impact your decision making and action taking at that particular point. Yeah. Uh, uh, Jane, you, Jane yeah. also says it's an amazing front door. So. Thank you. I'm so glad people like my front door. <laughs> Maybe <laughs> I'll have to put a picture up for all the students on the class and go like, here it is. Yeah, it's a cool door, but <laughs> yeah. Anyway, <laughs> Um, all right, so the downgrade danger zone, hypo awareness, um, is also going to hold true, but it's just going to reinforce the, the fact that this stuff, if you are aware of it at all, and I do believe you are, but it's at a very subconscious, perhaps unconscious, and I keep using those words because truly in the downgrade danger zone, you are unconscious. Um, uh, are you, well, if you're unconscious, you're in the downgrade danger zone, but there is a certain very, very low level of consciousness um, that also happens in the downgrade danger zone, but it's more your subconscious is operating. Everything is very low on the awareness scale, so it could be happening as well. Okay, um, we have a little bit more time. I'd like to talk about the differences between upgrade and downgrade awareness, intention, and engagement. Anyone have any comments or questions I can answer before I do that? Nope. Okay, so, um, all right, so upgrade awareness. To understand upgrade awareness, recognize that that upgrade part of awareness is a little bit of, is, of it is in stress, but most of it is in power stress. Power stress has associated with it a certain level of urgency, a sense of urgency. Let's get this thing done. Again, uh, power stress sounds like this. I know I need to do something. I know what I'm going to do, and I'm going to do it right now. So that urgency uh, is present and this impulsiveness is the dark side of that particular thing. So upgrade awareness is, oh, wow, look, X is happening. Oh, you know, there's this excitement around it. There's this, I mean, again, hyper awareness, you could be up in the danger zone where it's about fear is what's being really triggered. This is more about excitement and anticipation. Uh, this is, wow, look, X is happening. This is really, really cool, really, really cool. And we do experience moments like that uh, where, well, like, for example, recently I discovered that one of my favorite musical groups was doing a concert here in Phoenix. And so I went, oh my gosh, how many days before it's like, I was suddenly up there in hyper awareness. They're here. My ability was viewed, my ability to get tickets actually felt very low. The challenge very high because, oh my gosh, they've been coming for, for months now. And here I am realizing it, becoming aware of it at the very last minute. So I'm up there very excited, but still up there because like, I got to do something. I got to do it now, make that happen. So obviously I move very quickly into intention. And as I started to explore the ticket situation, I ended up fully engaged and I ended up buying the tickets, which by the way, were in the exact center of the whole audience. And this is for the group Pentatonics. I love Pentatonics. And so there it is in the exact center. Couldn't have hoped for better, better seats. And there I was. So, so you know, the, the divine was ready for me to, to get what, uh, what I wanted there. Um, any comments, thoughts? I see there's some comments popping in there. Oh, Jane was just asking which music group. And yeah, yeah. Penta I love Pentatonics. She said uh, great music. So. <laughs> Yeah, um, if you <clears throat> haven't seen them, don't know about them, look up Pentatonics. And if they're ever doing a Christmas concert in your area, their Christmas music is among their absolute best stuff. Anyway, now then, at the other end of things, we have downgrid awareness. Downgrid awareness is a little bit in apathy, mostly in power apathy. And the way I like to characterize downgrid awareness is this. You wake up in the morning, only one eye is barely open. Your ears have just tuned in and you go, hmm, sounds like it's raining. Now, this doesn't prompt you to launch out of bed to do anything. You're just kind of like, yep, I'm aware of it. X is happening. But you're kind of mellow about the whole thing. 
So you are aware of it, uh, but it's not demanding any immediate attention. There's no real tension about it. You're down grid, down in power apathy. And so I'm aware of it, but it doesn't seem to be demanding any attention right now, but I acknowledge it. How very cool. It's raining. <laughs> okay, so that's downgrade awareness. Now, <clears throat> uh, as you start to work with this particular slice of the of the um, of this layer, the change grid, there are a great many things that are happening with your clients and prospective clients where they are in upgrade awareness, perhaps even hyper awareness. Um, they generally don't seek us out because of a downgrade awareness or a hypo awareness. I mean, the hypo awareness. They don't even know what's happening. Um, but downgrade awareness does, does not trigger people to engage our services. And even if it's with an existing client, a downgrade awareness may not even pop up in conversation because people pay attention to where they find their tension. And so our clients are going to talk to us about things where they have more awareness, mid-grid awareness, which is just plain old awareness, um, or upgrid awareness, even hyper. This is what they're going to talk to us about. The downgrid awareness and hypo awareness awareness stuff may only come forward if we ask a question that suddenly draws attention to whatever those things happen to be. So people seek us out because of more upgrid and outgrid issues, not because of downgrid and ingrid issues. So that's a little bit about upgrid versus downgrid awareness. Questions, thoughts about that? Nope. nope. Uh, now that moves into intention. Now, intention is also tall enough as a slice on the change grid <clears throat> to uh, warrant a little bit of exploration about what happens if I'm in upgrid intention uh, versus downgrid intention. And certainly there's midgrid intention, which we don't need to talk much about because it's just intention. Now, upgrid intention, keep in mind, is mostly power stress and a little bit of the upper part of power. <clears throat> so, no real sense of urgency, certainly none of those uh, upgrade or stress sort of emotions happening. It's just this little upgrade intention. An upgrade intention sounds like this. I'm going to do X. There's like this declaration, this commitment that the person is making it. It has some enthusiasm and some passion around it. They're declaring out there, I'm going to do whatever. This is my intention. It all sounds very good. It's, there's a, a, usually it's more overt <clears> than <throat> that. Um, downgrade intention, on the other hand, is mostly in power apathy and a little bit of the southern part of power. But downgrade intention sounds like this. You know, maybe someday we should dot, dot, dot. Or, you know, if I get around to it, I'll blah, blah, blah. Or it wouldn't be bad for me to do dot, dot, dot. Or, you know what? Somebody really should dot, dot, dot. Downgrade intentions are often um, delegated to other people. <laughs> so, so, yeah, you're aware of it enough to get awareness happening. And you said, yeah, something could change. Maybe something even should change. Do I feel like being the one that does it? Mm, don't really know. Maybe I can find someone else who does it. Maybe I'll just watch and hope that maybe someone else will do it. So whatever. So downgrade intention is an acknowledgement that there is merit in the change happening or there is something that could be done, but there is not necessarily enough tension or enough drive to compel this particular individual to actually devote any serious energy to it. This becomes very, very important in your work as coaches when you are talking to a client and they do have a downgrade awareness and they do even formulate a downgrade intention. Do you hear enough commitment and passion, enough choice um, th that's in that to, to, to fuel the change actually occurring? Um, so very often downgrade intentions and downgrade awareness for that matter were uh, given to this individual by somebody else. So another friend, family member, coworker brought it to their attention. And so, yeah, now they have a downgrade awareness about it. And now they might even acknowledge or agree. Yeah, that could be good. But they don't have enough tension or drive around it to take that intention and move it to any kind of engagement themselves. Again, they're down in power apathy, perhaps even tipping their toe into apathy as far as the awareness goes. Thoughts about that? So, no, no upgrade intention, downgrade intention. Yep, yep, yep. Oh, I see a comment coming in. 
Uh, Jane's just saying clear. Okay, good. Great, great, great. Okay. Now, we move from intention to engagement. And even though it's now it's not quite as tall as the, the intention band was, and the intention is not quite as tall as awareness was, etc., there is still enough of a, of a difference between upgrade engagement and downgrade engagement. There's something worth talking about. So the difference between upgrade engagement and downgrade engagement. Upgrade engagement is when the person is like jumping in there actively doing it and there's kind of a uh, you, you know a, a frenzy around it and they're talking about and mobilizing people and everyone's getting gung-ho very cheerleader kind of things and hands-on active doing etc it's very noticeable it's quite vocal it's really present and, and it's there it's there so the engagement in a very noticeable uh, way uh, outwardly noticeable kind of way Compared to downgrade engagement, and the best way I can characterize downgrade engagement is this situation. Imagine you are a scientist, a research scientist, lost in your microscope, looking through that microscope for hours upon hours. Now, outwardly, people would say, well, he's not saying anything. She's not really... Um, you know, talking about it, not really doing anything, but you are lost, fascinated, intrigued, um, you know, on a mission, but it's quiet, it's, uh, it's subtle, it's private. So you are still as engaged, if not even more engaged than these upward engagement behaviors may be. You're far more focused. Again, if we imply, if we, oh, um, superimposed those uh, uh, energies, this part, downgrade engagement, is the analytical driver. And the upgrade engagement part would be the expressive driver. So even if I want to complete it, intention, solid intention, is the amiable driver, and the execution is the driven driver. So you can, you can overlay these layers you've been learning about to get even more detail around what's happening. So are we an expressive driver? That's engagement. Are we an analytical driver? That's engagement as well. Just uh, not quite as overt. Um, okay, thoughts, comments about that? So, yeah, so I have a daughter that loves to read and uh, mm -hmm. she may be reading a book and immersed in it. And I come in as, and ask her a question or have a conversation. You would think I interrupted the most important thing in the world. going. Yeah, on. right. She you've, goes, I'm reading a book. <laughs> right. You've pulled her out of, of her state. Right. And uh, she was deeply, deeply engaged uh, in whatever was going on. But because it's not overt, we don't really um, notice it all that much. That's right. Right. But had she been, you know, on the sports field in the middle of a play or whatever, you probably would not have asked her a question. <laughs> exactly. You know? So there you go. There you go. Um, all right. Now, again, applying this to uh, coaching work, um, we have to ask, where does the conversation begin? And so just to recap, and as I do this, I want you guys to think about the clients you've actually worked with and how those conversations began, how those conversations evolved. In all likelihood, you came to be in conversation because uh, the client had something that they were either hyper aware about demanding immediate attention or fully aware, even upgrade awareness. So I know it's happening. Um, I want to do something about it. You know, so you, you start hearing the intention. So, so this is what normally happens is that someone who is in a relative upgrade state of hyper awareness or awareness, and that now leads them to engage in dialogue. As you begin to work with them, what you're doing is clarifying, crystallizing the awareness parts of it, and then allowing that awareness to now move into intention. Now, it may move into an upgrade intention where they want to commit themselves in a very robust kind of way. It may be a very mid-grid intention where they are simply moving to the next logical step and saying, this is the plan, this is what I, I want to do, whatever it is. They may, though, move into downgrid intention. So the awareness is now led them to power apathy, even apathy where they go like, yeah, that is something that might be good, 
maybe someday, you know, whatever. So hopefully you are hearing in that moment that their level of enthusiasm, their level of productive tension has diminished. And that could be just fine. But uh, be aware of the, 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 the movement that's happened on the change grid, even in those few words. Um, so when that happens, uh, obviously, you're probably going to ask a few questions just to see if they really are just like no longer interested in that pursuit. Uh, great. And so move on to whatever's next. Or see if those questions uh, more, you know, reactivate them, uh, move their intention more up grid. Now that intention as you work with them, um, if they're on the course of, of reaching the outcome, it'll lead to engagement. And that engagement is about some planning that needs to happen, which is that downgrade kind of engagement. There is some preparation that may may need to occur, gathering your goodies, you know, getting everything all all uh, assembled um, and then there's also that idea about rallying the troops even if, the, if it's a troop of one um, there's this rallying that happens all that's engagement and there you are to help that individual to um, you know map that all out and uh, support them as they go about doing all these different aspects of engagement even if they move to downgrade engagement from intention that's fine because downgrade engagement is still engagement they're actively doing it but it may be more on that like analytical side of things the planning and, and the assessing scoping etc um, yeah so thought, thoughts about uh, about intention or engagement movement with clients no. Nope, it's all still good. Work's all happening. Clear. They're out grid. They're out grid. They're, they're doing. There's a driver energy that's kind of moving things forward. And then ultimately execution. Let's get it done. Let's finish it. And so you might be working them with them more now about accountability and uh, that sort of thing that's, that's happening there to get to execution. But always be aware that as they go about putting that, that engagement into its final action steps, actually doing it, that they don't step into the outgrid danger zone and end up hurting um, themselves or others in one way, shape, or form. So, uh, so that's what it's really all about. So our work, I think, is, as uh, coaches actually occurs, if you can see where I'm kind of circling around right now, this is where we really are. This is a sweet spot. So challenge tends to be high. The ability can range across the full, uh, the full scale, uh, but we tend to operate more here than we do down grid. Now, once we are working with a client um, and we have the opportunity to get to know them and to uh, be in, included in other thoughts and plans and insights they might have, you may find all sorts of untapped potential in this downgrade quadrant. In fact, we often say that, that um, power apathy and apathy often represents untapped potential. The person has got plenty of ability, but the challenges that they've taken on simply aren't stimulating. It's no longer a growth activity for them. It's something they can do on autopilot, or they've actually just kind of discarded it. It's gone down to hyper-awareness. Maybe by uh, providing them with good, solid coaching and asking really good questions, we can take some of that untapped potential and say, well, what happens if, what would happen if, or how might you be able to pursue some of these downgrade awarenesses and go, come up to a higher level of intention engagement? So uh, what, what could we do with all that? So untapped potential. Uh, is that something we might work with? But generally speaking, that's not where clients initially seek us out. Um, it may be where a client, now I'm thinking about more a corporate client, engages a coach to work with some of their team members. And now they're uh, wanting the coaching to be more of a developmental experience. So take this person who has this untapped potential, these hidden talents, and exercise them at a higher level, help them to explore ways of of exploring, uh, of deploying them uh, for, you know, growth and, and expansion, development, things like that. Okay, thoughts about, uh, about that? All clear. 
Okay, good. All right. Well, that's where uh, I think I'd like to end the lesson for today then. Your next step in the lesson plan would then be to participate in a discussion session. Um, now, Dave, uh, again, gets together senior members of the ChangeWorks uh, community and members of the ChangeWorks faculty and um, leads them in a discussion about the principles we've just covered in this lesson. So uh, if you go on to the discussion session, you'll be able to hear uh, that dialogue or that, that, that discussion. <laughs> Dialogue is what follows the discussion. That's when you get involved, you start talking about it as well. So the discussion to kind of learn about how do these, um, these principles play out in the work that they have actually done and how might it fit in very effectively in the work that you're doing with your clients as well. So with that, thank you all very much for joining in. Talk to you next time. Bye for now. <laughs>